Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about an incredible new discovery coming from these unusual objects known as brown dwarfs. And this time the scientists found a way to measure the speed of wind on the surface, which is really impressive considering the distances involved here. So let's talk a little bit more about this and welcome to What The Man. But I wanted to start right here on planet Earth. If you were to one day look into the southern region of the skies somewhere right here, you would actually see nothing. But there is a very nearby brown dwarf pair that's orbiting around one another in this location. Let's cheat a little bit, zoom in and see what we can find. So here, as I start zooming in, I'll start discovering certain objects. Although even at a relatively high zoom, they're still invisible to us. And eventually, we'll maybe get lucky and start seeing something. From somewhere right around here. Okay, still nothing actually, but there we go. I finally am able to kind of see this object. This tiny spot you see in the middle, that's actually a brown dwarf. A type of a, I guess, planet-like object, or technically a failed star, that never really became a star because it didn't have enough mass. If we were to jump here and take a look at its surface, this is maybe what it would look like. Although this is a simulation and a very rough one. This is maybe actually not a very accurate one either. And we even don't have a very good definition on what constitutes a brown dwarf in terms of the origin. For example, we think that maybe if a very large, very massive planet becomes a certain mass, specifically a mass of about 13 masses of Jupiter and more, it might start be classified as a brown dwarf, but it might have a very different composition. However, if a star is being created and just doesn't get enough mass to become a star, it will also turn into a brown dwarf. These two have slightly different way of being created, but could be considered to be the same objects. Their composition might be different though. On the other hand, we also think that depending on the mass, the temperature will change. Because the mass itself can be anywhere from about 13 to about 80 masses of Jupiter, the actual color and the temperature will be very different for pretty much every brown dwarf. And we classify them as one of four main types. The hottest type is known as M-type dwarf. The slightly cooler is known as L-type. The even more cooler is known as T-type. And the coolest one is known as the L-type. And all four types have been found pretty much everywhere and are quite common. As a matter of fact, they seem to be possibly even more common than stars. But just like a lot of other things in the galaxy, our solar system does not have one. And for this reason, we're actually really curious to learn more about them because there are a lot of really cool possibilities of these objects actually being very capable of sustaining life or possibly even having life in the upper atmosphere depending on the temperature because brown dwarfs are actually in the region where they could be considered to be habitable. Specifically these types of brown dwarfs like Wise 1828 have temperature ranges um, in their upper atmosphere that's actually equivalent to the temperature here on earth. So this is why studying brown dwarfs is really important and super fascinating. But what exactly did the scientists in the study do? Well, they actually found a way to relatively accurately measure how fast the wind on the surface of this type of an object moves um, around the planet. In other words, they found a way to compare the speed of the wind on a brown dwarf to the fastest winds in the solar system, Jupiter. And even though the results did not really surprise the scientists, they might be surprising to us, because we don't really hear much about brown dwarfs to begin with. The speeds here are really, really high. By essentially analyzing different layers of the brown dwarf they were looking at, they discovered that the average speed at the equator was roughly around 650 meters per second, which is actually about six times as fast as it is on the surface of Jupiter. And that is really, really high, but it's something that the scientists kind of expected to find. And because by looking at Jupiter, we already know that these really high winds allow the planet to have extreme climatic conditions on the surface and some of the craziest storms imaginable to humankind, we kind of now expect the brown dwarfs to be even crazier. Six times crazier at least. And what's more, as you can see from the simulation, the actual orbital speed here is about 1.7 hours. In other words, the brown dwarf rotates once around its axis in about 1.7 hours, which is also extremely fast. Once again, around six times faster than Jupiter. So this does have a lot of implications, especially if we try to compare the two objects. 
Apart from the implication in regards to the weather conditions, there are also a lot of implications when it comes to the magnetic field of these objects. As we expected, they probably have extremely active magnetospheres, much more active and much more, in some sense, dangerous than even Jupiter itself, which of course implies that if a brown dwarf has moons, or I guess you can technically call them planets, these planets might experience some really extreme conditions on the surface as well, as the magnetic field interacts with them. So this is something we would really like to investigate because there are several theories proposing that maybe brown dwarfs are actually real good locations for us to look for extraterrestrial life as well. And when you really think about it, these objects are extreme. Not only in terms of magnetosphere, but also just in terms of the actual rotation at the equator. You might remember that Jupiter has the orbital speed at the equator of about 12 km per second, so basically if you stand on the surface here, you're going to be moving at 12 km per second. A typical brown dwarf might actually have something closer to about 80 km per second. At least this one. This one definitely does. And that means that even trying to, I guess in some sense, enter the atmosphere of this planet would be almost impossible to modern spacecraft it would burn up in the atmosphere really, really quickly. So it would be really interesting to find out what kind of effects all of this has on the nearby objects, such as planets and moons. And obviously, because they spin so fast, they probably are not even spherical, they're probably more shaped like pancakes. While at the same time, because of the really powerful magnetosphere, any kind of a spacecraft trying to approach these planets would probably burn up as well. The magnetic field strength here would be so powerful that it would very likely completely destroy most of the um, computerized technology. But in case you were wondering how they were able to measure the wind speed of the planet itself, or the brown dwarf, it's also quite brilliant. They essentially used the observations that were captured in infrared, so basically the infrared frequency, combining them with the radio frequencies from a different telescope. Specifically, they used the so-called VLA and Spitzer telescopes. And these two observations show us different speeds, depending on what we're actually looking at. Turns out that if you were to look at the infrared observations, they basically show us the upper atmosphere. So all of the infrared observations only show us the top part of the planet, or the brown dwarf. Whereas the radio frequency shows us the interior of the planet, basically what's coming from the inside, and by finding the difference we can then try to estimate the speed of wind itself. This is exactly what they did and this is how they discovered the difference to be about 650 meters per second. This also means that we can now use a very similar technique for the nearby Loman 16 uh, brown dwarfs, and obviously all of the other brown dwarfs we've discovered over the past few years. Most of them are still really hard to see, but using new techniques we can very easily discover most of them in the vicinity. And by the way, if we were to try to simulate all of this in Space Engine, this is what this particular brown dwarf would probably look like, although maybe in slightly different color and also uh, with a lot more activity on the surface. This is a T-type uh, brown dwarf, and it's about 35 light years away from planet Earth. Not the closest object, but also obviously not the farthest. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that one thing that differentiates brown dwarfs from planets and stars is that, well, unlike stars, they're not actually able to fuse hydrogen. They don't produce any energy from hydrogen fusing because they don't have enough mass. But unlike planets, they are still able to fuse something. In this case, they either fuse lithium, or deuterium, and this allows them to produce some energy, which is why they have slightly different appearance to regular planets and also are so different from stars as well. And personally, I've always found brown dwarfs to be some of the most fascinating objects out there, mostly because, once again, we don't have any of them here in the solar system, and because we didn't even know they existed until uh, 1995, which is relatively recent when you think about it. So, in that sense, uh, these objects are quite fascinating. And we've only discovered more of them when we started to investigate nearby objects in the solar system by using infrared telescopes. So we can actually see them pretty easily in the infrared, but we don't really see them in visual light because, in reality, they're really quite dark. The actual amount of light coming out of here is almost invisible. But in terms of what they discovered in this particular study, that's pretty much it. But I'm sure that in the future we'll have a lot more fascinating discoveries about brown dwarfs and other objects that we don't have in the solar system. So make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and possibly come back tomorrow to learn something else. Also consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, and alternatively you can also support this channel by buying the beautiful wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.